Jeffrey Wilson and Alex Seaton are next. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you. Good afternoon. To assist and to enable. Good afternoon. To assist and to enable you to listen and not feel that you have to take notes while we're uh, speaking, we've provided a one page handout that includes a listing and a citation of all of the cases mentioned in the presentation so that when we refer to a case, we won't refer to the site. Jeffrey? You've had a, I understand that it's. Are we on here? Can you hear? I understand you've had a long day, so I'm going to start this uh, dialogue a little bit differently by telling you what will appear and what is, in fact, a story. And it goes like this. Once there was a woman, a mother of young children, who very much wanted to go away so that she could learn more, after which she would return to the land where she had been living, but now with greater knowledge. But alas, she could not leave her children. She loved them so dearly. And so she went about to do all that she had to do in order that she and the children could go. And this meant she planned the voyage without telling the children's father from whom she was estranged. Well, when the children's father discovered the plot, he became upset. He became angry. He said to the children's mother that she could not go with the children because after all, he loved them dearly too. It did not matter that she was going away in order to learn more or that she would return in a year's time. And so, faced with a conflict and an impasse, this mother and father went to the oracle. They bowed before the oracle, dressed in a black gown, sitting above them, and they pleaded their case. The oracle listened to them and pronounced, Yes, woman, you can go with the children, but how you went about this was not right and not deserving of the father's love of your children. And so you must pay him some money and you must know that how you held back the truth from the children's father is a wrong. But you, man, said the oracle, must know that you shall never tell your children what I have said about their mother or that I have told her to pay you for her wrong. You must never do this because the children love you both and they must not know of your failings and fighting. We start with the story partly to capture your attention. This gathering is after all a colloquium which by definition requires us to reflect upon our more practical and mundane pursuits. However, if we are guilty of storytelling, then is that so bad? Isn't that what the law is intended to do? To enable oracles to pass judgments that we may spread amongst the community in order for there to be ties rooted in myth that bind us together and thereby enable us to measure our conduct and enjoy a collective consciousness. Jeffrey, I think that we all know this story that you've related. It's uh, Justice Kitely's July 23rd, 1999 decision of Connolly and Magorum that had been referred to previously. Uh, Justice Kitely actually did direct the father and anyone else on his behest to never, and in the reasons the word never is actually underlined, to never tell the children about the judge's comments concerning the mother's, and I quote, inappropriateness of the manner of formulating and implementing the plan, end quote. The judge also prohibited the father from ever telling the children of her costs award against the mother. And although the mother succeeded in the litigation, she was nonetheless ordered to pay solicitor and client costs to the husband from June 4th, 1999, with payment to be made before she went away to Scotland. But really, how is the court to enforce this kind of order? In the December issue of the Ontario Family Law Reporter, I know you, Jeffrey, have referred to the aspect of the order directing something to never occur as judicial never never land. What was your point? Well, my point is, is that as unenforceable a decision as it is in this respect, one that really strains in my respectful submission any reasonable estimate of judicial authority and arguably a decision that from an analytic perspective may sow the seeds of a family secret and problems later on in the lives of the children, the case struck me as a refreshing rarity in another respect. Because here we have a judge 
who is unabashedly addressing the morality of the conduct of the parties. That is rare in my estimation because while there can be little doubt that the conduct of parties, their morality is implicit in the application of best interest law, in our pursuit of a politically neutral application of best interests, we have in fact created a moral application of law, where probably the only relevant morality is that of the judges as a function of his or her own background. Take the case of access between a child and a member of the estranged parent's extended family and figure out how the law has any meaning. Tell me how we are to advise our clients with any degree of reasonable predictability. More importantly, from the decisions, tell me what morality, what message we are sending out to the community. Jeffrey, you've raised these issues with me before, so let's look at the decisions. On the one hand, there are those decisions which speak to the child's need for freedom from, con from conflict. Rulings in Lusher, VG versus SL, or Milne, a 1985 appellate decision of the British Columbia Court of Appeal. I know, but conflict, there's conflict in everything we do in life. What did Nietzsche say? Something like, that which does not kill me makes me stronger. In the first case you mentioned, Judge Maine was worried that the intervention of a grandparent would affect the welfare of a child. But even in intact families, there is conflict. But my issue is not with the wisdom of any particular decision. They likely turn on the facts. Did you find any other cases? Well, Jeffrey, I think I mentioned that I, on the one hand, so on the other hand, in fact, there are decisions that appear to have placed the value of the extended family links above that of potential conflicts and interference in the views of the actions of the custodial parent. And I'm referring to the decision of Justice McDonald in Shabbat and Ho Holiday, and Henry Vogelsang's Malash and Frank, and Patty Hardman's decision in Peck. Fine, but how do we know which morality or message or myth from those opposite rulings govern governs in any particular case. Consider the recent decision of Schrendoff versus Bruhand, a September 8, 1999 decision, court file number D273-98, found at 13 OFL 62. The judge of first instance, Judge Wilkins, considered that the hostility between the father, Bruhand, towards the deceased mother's sister, Schrendoff, to be such as to outweigh the benefit of contact between the maternal aunt residing in Victoria and her 10-year-old niece. Justice Greer, hearing the appeal, must certainly, so I respectfully submit, have applied her own values in deciding that the trial judge, who had the opportunity, as they say, to observe the demeanor and character of the parties, erred. Read the two decisions. Tell me how we could guide our clients on this issue. Tell me what morality or message or myth should be conveyed by reference to two decisions that come to two different conclusions even though one of the oracles heard from the parties directly. Justice Greer relied upon the appellant decision of Legati versus Richardson, an appeal from her own experience as a trial judge to conclude that Judge Wilkins committed an error in principle. My point is this, ladies and gentlemen, these errors in principle are, so I would respectfully argue, one wise person's assessment versus another. And the failing with this is, firstly, there's no predictability in the law. Secondly, if every case turns on its facts and the values of the judge hearing those facts, then how does the law act as a story, a myth or a moral message upon which the community can rely? Thirdly, if every case turns on its facts and the values of one judge versus another, then why not litigate every case? Or keep on litigating until you find the judge whose values are supportive of your client. And fourthly, is there not a greater duty upon the judicial oracles to be mindful of the role of law in terms of offering some degree of consistency? Or should we just admit that family law disputes concerning children are so factually driven as to have no place in the arena of juridical thought? Well, Jeffrey, what, what would happen if we did that, if we did remove the family custody disputes from the juridical oh. thought and practice, as you put it? Wouldn't be enough time today. But I think we could come up with better stories. First of all, better myths. I think we would come up with more ties to bind the community in respect of proper or acceptable parental behavior. And definitely, any alternative would provide for a more exacting accountability for truth and conduct. You prepared, I know, in advance of this lecture, an outline of cases on the matter of the wishes of children. How important are those wishes? And when those wishes become suspect by reason of parental influence? And what our courts have to say about this? Tell me, what do they have to say 
about the situation of a grieving mother whose daughter has been alienated from her and whose father is proclaiming that event to be a function of the child's wishes or her rights under the law of Canada, likely the Charter, and now likely the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and therefore in her best interest. You can tell us the law, but I'll tell you what they say in my usual presumptuous way. If you influence a child long enough and hard enough so that the child perversely internalizes the influence, you will likely win under best interest jurisprudence. Children as young as 12 years of age will meet with the judge in chambers and determine their well-being, or too many judges will avoid telling a 12-year-old what to do. This is incredible, a word that I use to drive home dramatically my point. We don't even let children go about prospecting until the age of 18 years under the Mining Act, or from working in a riding stable until I believe the age of 15 under the Riding Horse Establishment Act. But the same child can effectively determine where she will live at 12. Now what myth or morality does that convey? I'm having difficulty understanding what I'm hearing. Aren't you the defender of children's rights? Did you, uh, did you need some time out to reflect on what you've just said to all of these people, given your history? You uh, think about that. But I think what I can tell everyone else on this matter of perverse influence of children and their wishes, I've come across in Canada three decisions where the conduct of a parent in influencing the child was so clear as to interfere or override the child's stated wishes. One of them is Jones, which is Justice uh, Hugh O'Connell's decision of November 30, 1994. Another is IFRA, a decision of Justice Sirwa. And the third is one where Jeffrey, I think we find your phone number, announced to the world, that's the Bukima decision, it's a decision of Justice McDonald, Ellen McDonald. And I noted that in the first two decisions, you managed to avoid your personal phone number being published. What happened in that last Bukima case? Live long enough and anything will happen. The Bukima case was one where I erred in judgment, in hindsight, maybe even at the time, and inadvertently became part of a parent's crusade. But if you think about it under our law, why wouldn't any parent feel permitted, if not obliged, to act as the mother did in that case, even putting aside my error, given the climate of rights and wishes that is part of our legal system? Let me put it another way to drive home the point. No judgment in all of the cases that I have read in our judicial system has been written about a mother or father who sacrificed for their children and thereby, by the act of sacrifice, derive a bliss. Our judicial system is about people as parents going to court to get as much as they can. It is the epitome of really a capitalist Western world where one's free choice means individual pursuit at all costs. As a result, the stories that come from our oracles in the form of judges are about people who don't sacrifice, indeed parents who will do anything to win. What we have is a system of storytelling or morality that is adversarial in nature and therefore by that fact alone does not have room for sacrifice and bliss. Mrs. Bukima was doing just that. She was out to do what she could to protect her child as she saw it. That meant taking on the child's father. That meant involving her daughter. Now even in cases where the influence is not perverse, Children in our society, through our court process, are learning the same values and emulating the same conduct as that as the adults who pride themselves on their free choice and individual pursuit of their rights at all costs. It defies any myth of which I am aware coming from any society of any time of which I am unaware for an 11 or 12 year old child to decide what is best for her. How is the child gonna live with that decision? But children are doing just what we do, which is exercise their free choice and pursue their individual rights at all costs. And we are teaching that to them through this process of a law. And there's a lot of them around, considering the number of separated families in Canada. As for the defender of the faith children's rights question, I will assume that you're being more than rhetorical. And I will reply by saying, more today than perhaps yesterday, children's rights does not mean emulating the worst of adults. Equality rights applied to children does not mean imitating those who are older. Or let me put it this way. If the exercise of rights is attached to individual happiness, then a nine-year-old resisting her parents' deportation without being heard has to do with children's rights. And similarly, a nine-year-old child who is spared the dilemma of having to choose as between her parents also has to do with children's rights. Let's test what you're saying against the jurisprudence. There is a case of an 11-year-old whose wishes did rule the day. That's Metz. 
and two cases where 12-year-olds had their way. Those are Smith and Lewis and Pitka. But there's also Alexander, Holland, Young, Stanley, Martell and Vatcher, Hudson, and Miller and Rayom, where children as old as 14 years of age have had their wishes turned down. And most recently in Fanato, which is an unreported decision in Ottawa of Justice Chadwick, September 17, 1999, file number 57383-98, there the court observed that an 11-year-old who would not return to his mother spoke more to the fact of the father having very little control over him, and the judge suggested that the child would be completely out of control as he entered his teenage years, and therefore, in spite of his, that child's stated wishes, he should be with his mother. So the cases appear to offer a myriad of responses where the children are as old as 14 years of age are told what to do in spite of their wishes, and other cases where the courts seem to be listening to children as young as 11. I could therefore argue that in each case, that each case represents a judge's attempt to respond sensitively to the particular or peculiar needs of the child, and what is the problem with that? I might argue that the few cases that exist in respect of extreme influence, in fact, speak well to the fact that these cases are weeded out early from the adversarial process through the intervention of a judge at an early stage or an assessment process or the involvement of the children's lawyer, who, as you know, in the Bukima decision, made clear the position that the child's wishes could not be relied upon. So I ask you, what, what is the concern then? You might be right. However, it's the case that in each of the decisions to which you reference, without a doubt, in each of those decisions, there was substantial litigation and a process that involved the child over a lengthy period of time to the child's detriment. I would argue, if we had more time, that the process itself, that substantial period of time where the parties are litigating, is probably more harmful than the result of any judicial decision. If that is the case, then perhaps it behooves us, I don't know, to ask why we are using the courts to examine these kinds of issues. Well, where else could we deal with these issues? Let me leave you with this thought for only colloquialism reflection. <laughs> we remove custody and access law from the law books, other than international enforcement. Of course, we maintain child protection and criminal law so that parents understand that a minimum standard of care governs and that criminal conduct will not be tolerated. Then, we institute custody and access resolution halls. When there is a dispute, the family and anyone else who is interested in the welfare of the children have to go and sit, as long as it takes, <laughs> for them to resolve the problem. Assisting them is an oracle of their choice, someone who has their joint confidence but who cannot make a decision. Only the family can do that. And like a jury sequestered, they cannot come out until they've made their decision. Perhaps each one of these halls could have a fireplace. And as an announcement to the world, no less significant for the family and the community than the appointment, for example, of a new pope, a fire would be lit. And the drift of smoke from the smokestack would announce resolution. In the article which I am doing for this program, I have attempted to examine other cultures. Arguably, and by most people's objective standards, much less civilized than ours. But these are societies who have nonetheless devised systems for dispute resolution that do offer clear messages to the community and afford some relief for blasphemous conduct. This is different, you see, from our system. Our system, so I argue, allows every parent to have their day in court and effectively thereby rewards them for their wrongdoing. Each one of them gets a very good lawyer and an excellent attentive judge and the protections of the laws of evidence as the problem that belongs to them gets distracted and relegated to others with minimum benefit to the community at large. On behalf of both of us, we'd like to thank you for your attention. And I don't know if any of you were at our, we gave a similar speech a few months back. And in that, we noted at the end that the thoughts and opinions that we express do not belong to either of us. And the statements we have made are strictly on a without prejudice basis. Thank you.
The last panel of the day will be chaired by Carol Rogerson, who all of you know, she's a professor at the University of Toronto and has specifically asked me to allow her to introduce herself and the panel. So here's Carol. I'm going to do a very brief introduction to the panel, its themes, and the panelists. I think one way of thinking about this panel is that it really uh, springboards from an idea that was expressed uh, by the federal government in its response to the Special Joint Committee on Custody and Access. There's one phrase that leaps uh, out of that response. Carol Curtis has already uh, used it in her comments today. And that's the phrase, one size does not fit all. Uh, increasingly, uh, there is a growing recognition that custody and access solutions that are appropriate for one group of parents and children are not appropriate for others. At one end of the spectrum, we have cases that settle outside of court with either negligible or minimal legal assistance and interventions from me mental health professionals. At the other end of the spectrum, it is estimated that between 10 to 20 percent of the divorcing population are uh, what is increasingly being labeled high conflict. You've heard that term uh, a lot today. Uh, 10 to 20 percent of the divorcing population are characterized by um, high levels of conflict, uh, tension, hostility that go on for years after the separation um, and divorce. Um, in a significant number of these cases, there is violence. In a number of the cases, there is uh, what is sometimes called parental alienation, and I don't want to uh, legitimize that term by using it. Uh, more frequent, in more colloquial language, uh, it's what's uh, been referred to as uh, estrangement of a child, a child being aligned with one parent. Um, these cases of high conflict and violence pose enormous challenges to the family law system. We are increasingly recognizing that the dominant models of shared parenting, parental cooperation, and maximizing continuing contact with both parents are not appropriate for the subset of families where there is high conflict and violence. We are increasingly recognizing that these families need specialized responses. And I think one of the struggles that the family law system now faces is what are these specialized responses? Uh, what are appropriate custody and access responses in these difficult cases? How do we think about the best interests of children? What kinds of dispute resolution processes are appropriate? Are these the kinds of cases that will inevitably have to be dealt with by the courts? Or is there a role for non-legal interventions? Um, and to help us grapple with these issues, um, we have our panel today. Uh, first of all, Peter Jaffe, and I'm going to be extremely brief in my introductions uh, in the interest of time. Uh, Dr. Jaffe is a clinical and research psychologist who is currently director of the London Family Court Clinic. Uh, his research has focused extensively on violence against women and children. Uh, we have Jeffrey Wilson who has already spoken and very familiar to many of you. Uh, Jeffrey has practiced family law and children's law in Toronto for over 20 years and is identified uh, as a defender of children's rights and is the author of a leading textbook on children and the law. Uh, Wilson McTavish, who has since 1984 uh, been Ontario's children's lawyer, what used to be referred to as the official guardian, charged with the responsibility for delivering legal services on behalf of children in proceedings in Ontario, including custody and access cases. And finally, Karen Weiler, uh, who has since 1992 uh, been a justice of the Ontario Court of Appeal. In her prejudicial life, she was senior counsel in, poli in the policy development division of the Ministry of the Attorney General and worked extensively on family law issues. Uh, we are going to begin uh, this last session uh, with Peter Jaffe, uh, who is going to um, give us the perspective from the social sciences on this range of very difficult high conflict cases with a particular focus on cases involving domestic violence. Thank you. I'm going to move down here for the, uh, I'm going to use the slides, if I can get some of the lights. Um, Again, when you think about uh, Jeffrey Wilson's solution about having the family halls where the uh, family stay and work it out and then smoke comes up through the chimney, 
Um, I think you're going to have to be careful to screen out some of the cases because if you put some families in that situation, you're going to do an awful lot of harm um, to a number of family members. And I want to focus on those kinds of cases that hopefully will be screened out of uh, uh, Jeffrey's Hall. I'm going to focus particularly on the issue of domestic violence and how children are affected by domestic violence. And again, I, I always think that most of what I'm going to say, everybody in the audience already has heard, and it always feels like it's old news. However, I, I feel revitalized after hearing the earlier panel and having the judges grapple with the case that involved the city of Chicago and a mother leaving an abusive situation to come to Toronto. Um, I'm not, not in any way going to second guess any of the decisions offered on a very short case scenario. But you did hear from two of the judges who actually said to you that in that case, the woman was abused, it was a battered woman, and somehow that was independent of the welfare of the children. Those aren't the exact words, I don't want to misquote. But to me, the most important thing I'm going to tell you in the next 10 minutes is that when there is spousal abuse going on in a family, the children are adversely affected. And one of my propositions to you today is that you cannot be a violent husband or a violent wife in some circumstances. You cannot be a violent spouse and still be a good parent. Those two things simply don't go together. The minute you're a violent spouse, in fact, what you're doing it is you're jeopardizing the well-being of your children. You're offering a very poor role model. You're creating a climate of fear and terror, and you're having an adverse impact whether those children are 14 years old or 14 days old. There's a lot of research coming out, both in the US and Canada and internationally, that suggests that children, even at very early ages, even uh, in their first year of life, uh, when they're exposed to trauma, when they're exposed to people yelling and screaming, hitting, throwing dishes, that in fact is a traumatic experience which may have a dramatic impact on their brain development and can affect them later on in life the extent to which they can go from a, a state of calm to a state of terror or a state of rage. And I think uh, all too often we overlook this. And uh, I'm, just to make this point, rather than talking about a lot of research, I'm going to uh, play a very short 911 call from a little girl, six-year-old girl named Lisa, who's calling the San Diego Police Department because her mother is being abused. I apologize in advance for doing this. This is difficult to listen to. It's only five minutes. Um, but I want you to listen to it, and I want you to forever etch this 911 call in your brain. So whenever somebody says to you, well, he never hit the kids. Every time someone says that to you, every time someone says to you, well, the kids were asleep. The kids didn't know what was going on. He never hurt the kids. He only hurt his wife. Every time someone says that, I want you to think of this uh, very short clip. Mommy. Coffee or any 
Okay, don't, don't start running to the police. Okay. Okay, now where's your mother at right now? She's in the room running with the... <laughs> but you, do you have a little baby sister? No, I got baby brother. Is he trying to take your baby brother? Baby. And he's trying to take your baby? Yeah, because he... Mama's not drunk. He thinks he's drunk because he can't say nothing because he's drunk. apologize for playing this for you, but I think it's an important reminder. Think about this for a moment. Lisa's only six years old, and she says this has been going on forever. In this situation, there's no knife, no gun, and the police came in time, and there was shoving and pushing going on. So no weapons, no permanent injuries that resulted from this police occurrence. Lisa's not being physically abused. She's not being sexually abused. But it's clear to hear from her voice that she's being significantly traumatized simply from being exposed to violence, from witnessing violence within her family. So again, every time someone says to you, well, um, he never hit the kids, I want you to think about this tape and think about the impact that this violence has indirectly. And again, just to put this in context, within Canada, we know from a study that's too small to read here, but we know from Stats Canada, um, and again, at tab 11, there's an article that goes into more detail, so you can read this at your leisure. But according to Stats Canada, 29% of all Canadian women are physically or sexually abused at some point in an intimate relationship. 10% of women experience abuse at a level that at some point they worry for their personal life or their safety. When there's children present in the home, for the vast majority of those children are exposed to this violence. And this is really important because if you ask adults whether or not children are exposed to violence. Most adults think that children were asleep or visiting friends. The reality, when you, interview, when you interview children, what you find out when you interview children, what you find out very clearly is that most children are exposed to the violence. 85 to 90 percent of children, when you interview them, will tell you what they've seen, what they've heard, and what many children describe it's not just what they're an eyewitness to, but it's often uh, they may be hiding uh, behind the bedroom door. They may be at the top of the stairs. They may be walking into uh, a room shortly after an incident of violence, or they're seeing the aftermath of violence. But for the most part, children are, children are exposed to a great deal of violence. What children talk about is that they're raised in a climate of fear and terror. That many children will tell you, if they've told me, that even the calm times are bad times. Violence may only happen once or twice a year, but children may spend the rest of their time being quite hypervigilant, listening to when voices get raised, listening to when somebody buys an extra case of beer. They may be very vigilant to uh, a number of these warning signs. So even the good times aren't so good because children remain vigilant when the violence is going to occur again. We also know there's overlap between different kinds of abuse. Although today I'm going to focus, I'm focusing on children exposed to violence, we know in families where a mother's being abused, there's about a 50% chance that eventually the children are also going to be abused if they haven't already been. We also know there's 30% of cases where children suffer sexual abuse. So there may be overlaps of different kinds of abuse that take place within the same family. And again, I want to be very clear, today I'm focusing on the issue in terms of women being abused, their mothers being abused. I recognize there are situations where fathers are abused. We recognize that according to police statistics in Ontario, during 1998, 
And 90% of the calls involve women as victims of violence in terms of police calls. About 8% involve men as victims of violence. And about 2% are men and women in same-sex relationships across this province. So again, when we talk about this issue, um, it's not a gender neutral issue and anybody who wants to talk about that more, I'll, we can talk about that at the next break. Um, when we look at the impact of, a, of, uh, of children witnessing violence, um, children who witness violence suffer major emotional and behavior problems. Um, again, if you look at some recent studies uh, that were done in our jurisdiction, boys who witness violence have 17 times the rate of serious emotional behavior problems compared to boys who have this experience, and girls have 10 times the rate of serious emotional and behavioral problems. 57% um, of children who've been exposed to violence, uh, in fact, show all the signs and symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. So when you listen to a girl like Lisa, um, you can understand the aftermath of being exposed to violence can be quite serious in terms of children's short-term and also long-term development. And again, I think I'm emphasizing this point with Lisa because um, anybody here you know, who practices law knows that an incident like the one I just played for you, the 911 call, by the time it gets to court a year later, if it ever gets to court, is going to be minimized and reduced to almost nothing. It's just a bad night, it was a conflict, it was a bad marriage, a lot of conflict went on. It's going to be reduced and minimized so much that it's going to lose its total impact in court. And I'm, all, I'm, I'm always amazed at, at how I see incidents described way after the fact by the time they, they hit the courtroom. And again, it's hard to capture, unless you have 911 calls, which is rare, it's hard to capture what kids have actually gone through, what they've experienced. And children who are exposed to violence often also develop some very distorted attitudes and beliefs about, about the use of violence and the appropriateness of using violence in relationships. We did a study a number of years ago. We asked boys and girls who were exposed to violence if it was okay for a man to hit a woman. And these are some of the answers that we got. You're not supposed to hit anyone except the woman doesn't do as she's told. Yes, it will, if it will solve the problem they're hitting the person for. Yes, when she's drinking or he's drinking or if he thinks the woman has lost respect for him. So part of, part of the impact is not just behavioral and emotional problems. It's not just um, the impact of short and long-term trauma. It's also distorted attitudes and beliefs about the appropriateness of violence within the context of intimate relationships. Again, anybody who works within the juvenile court will tell you about the overlap between children being exposed to violence and being aggressive in their adolescence. In fact, 70% of all young offenders charged with crimes against people that get referred to our clinic in London have witnessed violence in their family of origin. And many studies suggest that being exposed to violence is a very significant factor in terms of later delinquent behavior and also adult criminality. And again, in terms of the long-term consequences, the single best predictor of being a batterer in an adult relationship is witnessing violence in the family of origin. And witnessing violence in the family of origin is higher than alcohol, poverty, abuse, mental illness, bad genes, you name it. The single most powerful factor in terms of predicting violence in the next generation is whether or not um, boys observe their fathers being violent um, to their mothers when they were growing up. And a study by Murray Strauss and his colleagues, University of New Hampshire, found that sons of batterers have white beating rates which are 1,000% greater than sons of nonviolent fathers. Again, what I want to emphasize is that violence has an impact when children are simply exposed to it. And let me just tell you my conclusions, then we'll turn it over to the, uh, back to the panel. One of, my, one of my major conclusions is that most of the li divorce literature we use um, doesn't apply to this group. Most of the things that we, that have, the knowledge that's developed over the years in terms of research on divorce and children, all the things that we say about, you know, you have to, you're separating as a husband and wife, but your parents forever, you have to put the past behind you, are totally irrelevant when it comes to high conflict cases where violence is an issue. Because in fact, rather than putting the past behind you, it may be a situation where you have to assess the past. We have to be doing a lethality assessment. We have to be developing safety plans because we know from research that men who are batterers in relationships, when their relationship is over, often use access, not to get access to kids, but in fact get access to their partner. And in one quarter of cases in the sample from Nova Scotia, one quarter of men who are abusive in a relationship uh, continued to be abusive during access, and there was new, new incidents of violence during access exchange 
or, or new threats of violence. So again, the violence doesn't end with separation, but in fact, the violence may escalate and take uh, different forms. Rather than separation being a factor to lead us to minimize violence, in fact, um, separation is a factor that's on the lethality checklist in terms of when violence uh, may, be, may be worse. So again, Janet Johnson and others have said that most courts are using the wrong literature for the wrong cases. For all the, ca all the cases that never come to court, the people who may see a lawyer once or twice where things settle, uh, or work out deals at the kitchen table, those are all wonderful cases for shared parenting and joint custody, and, and they don't need the benefits of the court. In fact, we use research from that sample and apply it to the 20% or 15% who are in court in high conflict cases, and it's the wrong literature applied to the wrong sample. Um, we tend to also want to indicate two other things in, in closing. We often minimize reports of violence, and we know there's a lot of backlash that somehow violence is exaggerated for the purpose of custody. In fact, what the research suggests in Canada, um, violence is underreported. Only one in four women who are abused in an intimate relationship actually call the police. The majority of women tell no one. So by the time it comes to a custody hearing, there isn't usually the long police reports or detailed evidence to present to court, which I know raises some special issues. And we often minimize uh, how the violence has actually impacted children. And my conclusion is that in Ontario, um, we need some presumptions that uh, in cases of spousal abuse, the spouse who is the primary aggressor and the abuser, there should be presumption against custody or joint custody, similar to the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, which are recommended a model code in the U.S. And in fact, over half the U.S. states have this presumption in place, and it's currently lacking in Ontario. The Joint Committee on Domestic Violence, was, which was chaired by Madam Justice Leslie Baldwin, recommended that Ontario change the Children's Law Reform Act to very clearly make this, uh, put this presumption in place. The other thing I want to say uh, briefly is we also not only have to be cautious about custody and joint custody, we also have to be cautious about access because there may be circumstances where access either should be non-existent or supervised or exchanges should be supervised and we have to develop a better way of developing um, safety plans for many uh, men and women in these uh, circumstances. What's needed is not promoting relationships. What needed, what's needed is better lethality assessments and better safety plans. Um, we'll come back to this point, but to deal with this issue more and more in the cases I'm involved in, what usually happens is someone appears on the other side and talks about parent alienation and indicates that the mother is so protective and she's doing this, in fact, to alienate the kids against the father. I just want to say at the outset, that parent alienation has no literature behind it. There are case studies, and there's absolutely no reliability or validity studies to indicate that parent alienation syndrome exists as a syndrome, although we all recognize there are parents, and many parents in divorce situations, who may alienate children against the other parent. I think the, the, one of the most important conclusions from Janet Johnson in these high conflict cases, of which domestic violence is a large category, is we have to stop pretending we can force people to be cooperative and jeopardize their safety and the well-being of the children. And instead, we have to accept, we have to sort of cut our losses and accept there has to be a highly structured plan that will protect um, divorcing spouses and also protect children in these circumstances. And what we need is, is a good, safe, structured, parallel parenting plan or parallel contact plan. And we have to totally abandon and accept, to accept that we have to abandon cooperative parenting because it'll lead just to ongoing conflict in many situations, ongoing danger. I'll leave my opening comments at that. I just wanted to make a few uh, follow-up comments to Peter's presentation on the issue of domestic violence and custody and access cases. And one thing I'd like to make the audience aware of um, is once again to turn to the federal government's uh, response to the Special Joint Committee on Custody and Access. And in that response, the federal government has emphasized uh, as one of the principles to structure its examination and rethinking of our current um, system of custody and access is that all aspects of the family law system must take into account incidents of family violence and that ensuring the safety of all parties involved must be the guiding principle. And I think what that report emphasizes is the need for um, a really systemic approach. And I would note, uh, as did Peter, 
that many other jurisdictions have made much more progress in dealing with issues of domestic violence than we have. Some jurisdictions have uh, legislated, uh, have um, made um, a uh, incidence of domestic violence an express factor uh, to be considered in custody and access determinations, have uh, legislated a presumption that custody should not be awarded to perpetrators of domestic violence, have legislated presumptions against joint custody in cases of domestic violence. Um, in some jurisdictions as well, uh, family courts uh, have um, implemented guidelines, comprehensive guidelines for all personnel in the court system, mental health professionals and um, legal actors for how to deal with cases of domestic violence, including um, uh, factors to uh, aid in um, risk identification, the need for specially trained assessors in cases where domestic violence has been alleged, and very complex uh, sets of guidelines for determining appropriate custody and access outcomes. And on that point, I would just like to make you aware of a recent decision of the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal where some of these systemic um, issues and guidelines were actually taken into account by the court. This is a decision of the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal in a case called Hader, H-I-D-E-R, and Malik, a decision of May 17, 1999. This was a case that involved custody of what was then, um, I think, a five or six year old girl who had been uh, up to the point of trial in the sole custody uh, of the mother. The father, there were two documented incidents of uh, domestic violence um, that the father had perpetrated on the mother. Largely on the basis of an assessment by a social worker, the trial judge awarded custody to the father. That case uh, was appealed and the result was overturned on appeal. And one of the significant factors in the Saskatchewan Court of Appeals reasoning uh, was the assessment. The assessment had been conducted by a social worker who had no experience and no expertise in dealing with cases of domestic violence. What the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal found was that the social worker had violated the model standards of practice for child custody evaluations developed by the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts, which required that in every case where there was either established domestic violence or allegations of domestic violence, an assessor uh, who did not have uh, expertise in domestic violence should call in uh, uh, an assessor who did. That was not done in this case, and that was one of the bases uh, for the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal a turn overturning the decision of the um, of the uh, uh, trial court. Uh, what I'd like to move on to now, we're very tight for time, uh, is parental alienation, um, another manifestation of these high conflict divorces. Peter has given us some, um, I think, interest, some very useful insights into uh, parental uh, alienation. Uh, a situation where the child appears very strongly aligned uh, with one uh, parent. Peter has alerted us to the need to uh, investigate uh, allegations of parental alienation in the context of domestic viol violence and really alerted us to the need to um, uh, investigate why one child, why a child does not want to see the other parent. However, I think we have to recognize that all, not, not all cases of um, uh, children being estranged from one parent or aligned with one parent are going to involve domestic violence. Uh, there are going to be cases where safety uh, is not an issue. And I'd just like our panelists to spend a few moments um, uh, thinking about these difficult cases uh, and the difficult issues that um, these cases of parental alienation and uh, reluctance of a child to have access uh, with one parent raise. We have a parent who is wronged, um, uh, who is perhaps being denied an opportunity to develop a significant relationship with the child. Uh, yet our current uh, framework for thinking about these issues says that the parent's um, uh, interests um, are really not relevant. We must focus on the child's uh, best interests. And then how do we think about the best interests of children uh, in these cases? I think as Jeffrey pointed out in his uh, earlier talk, uh, in many of these cases children are expressing their wishes that they wish not to uh, see a parent, not to have contact with a parent. Um, 
how do we think about best interests? Do we go with the children's wishes? Do we take a long-term view that contact uh, might, uh, in the long run, be in the best interests of children? What is the role of law in these cases? Can it force contact, or does it just have to accept the status quo? Uh, is there room for other kinds of interventions? Can mental health uh, professionals uh, help in these cases? I'd like to ask our panelists, Jeff, parental alienation. Well, I, I, the points I would make in parental alienation are, uh, I agree with Peter, if this is what he was saying, that I view parental alienation as also not gender neutral, and that uh, it is often thrown at the female parent who is acting right or wrong in the belief that something harmful has happened to the child. The difficulty with the system that we have now, as point two, is that then that parent has to carry the torch. And the more that parent carries the torch, the more it foments or fuels conflict which pits one parent against the other. And so systemically, I have raised it once, or more than once, one wonders why where there's an allegation made by one parent that something harmful has happened to the child, which then, that action then leads to the reaction, you're alienating the child from me, whether there would be a more summary procedure or whether we would take it out of the private custody dispute arena, just posing this, and it becomes really a child protection problem. That is, has the wrongdoing actually occurred? And then there's a court that has particular expertise in dealing with the event of alleged wrongdoing, rather than having a custody case, which is really a fact-finding determination of whether or not this harm occurred with the protective parent saying I'm only doing what I need to do, understandably so, to protect the child, and the other parent saying you're brainwashing the child, and with the awful result at the end of the day that if it goes on for any length of, the, of time, then there's a lot of jurisprudence that does say that even if the child has internalized a perverse feeling of hatred towards one parent, then that perverse bonding, so to speak, still outweighs any other issue because if I ignore that factor, then I'm really getting into the conduct of the parents so that the judge is really is faced with the dilemma of the 10 or 11, 12 year old saying, or even younger in some cases saying, this is what I want, this is where I want to be. And the court says, well, it's disappointing to the parent, but uh, this is what we have to do with the result that the wrongdoer, alleged wrongdoer, we have to use these words carefully, gets rewarded. Wilson? I love the way how Jeffrey talks in the terms of tort. Uh, the, the children's lawyer takes a little different tact in the sense that our role is to represent the interests, the legal interests of the child, that it is the court's decision to make the decision in the best interests of the child, and that it is up to the parents with our assistance when we're appointed to tell us and to tell the court what has happened and what the history of this family is and to see uh, whether uh, the perverse hatred that uh, Jeffrey talks about exists and in those very rare circumstances uh, then uh, children and we've had in one case where the children wouldn't even talk to us they were so uh, traumatized by the parent the quote wrongdoer so our role is to place into context for the judge what has happened to this child and uh, to make the decision. If the child, like in Bikima, consistently says that she wants to go to live with mother, and it is clear when you read the case and you see it, that the child has a much better relationship with her custodial parent, the father, on observation and in relationship, and that's what the judge ordered in that case, that notwithstanding the child's consistent but not independent wishes, then uh, the children's lawyer advocates in context and says it would not be in that child's interests uh, to uh, be with mother. Karen, can you give us a judicial perspective on Parental alienation, children expressing very strong views. 
about no contact with one parent? Well, if you wait till you get to the Court of Appeal to sort this out, I think that in many cases it will unfortunately be almost too late to try and, and repair the situation. I think the key is early intervention to try and get at the cause for the uh, parental alienation. And I think the causes are, are quite uh, varied. Um, it can be, as we heard in the 911 call, that uh, uh, violence uh, is there. It is clearly a, a, a major factor. But as I understood that call, for example, alcoholism was, was uh, certainly at work there because the child was saying, my stepdaddy's drunk. Mm -hmm. and. Certainly, there were um, prior several years ago when, when I was a trial judge, there, there were uh, uh, places that uh, uh, were willing to act as a neutral focal point for access with respect to a child so that uh, if, uh, if a parent with a problem, with an alcohol problem, wished to exercise access to a child and the child was, uh, was concerned about seeing that parent, what you had then was a neutral supervised access place where the parent could go could visit with the child, play games with the child, provided that the parent turned up sober. I'm thinking of a place that was run by the Children's Aid Society and, and it was uh, uh, in a, I think, a, a school or, uh, that, that had a gym. So, I mean, these things are possible pr to, to, to put into place, provided that there are, is a, uh, there are resources to deal with them. Um, another uh, aspect uh, that uh, could, could potentially work would be, um, again, at, at, the, um, at the level of early intervention would be if, if people would agree in advance that any uh, conflicts between them would go to mediation with a particular mediator and this person could be accessed basically by way of a pager any time. I mean, if you have enough money, you can do just about anything and, and that, is, that is one possibility. Of, uh, of having someone that both parents respect to, to get in there and get in there early as soon as the problem develops. Uh, sometimes with children, you're gonna find, I think, that, that we talk, talk about parent, parental alienation. They don't wanna go visit a parent, but they don't wanna go visit a parent because it means that they're missing their hockey game or their friends or something that is surrounding the custodial parent and it has nothing to do really with the other parent. And I think it's important to find that out why is it that the child is, doesn't want to go see the other parent? Is it, is it because the custodial parent has perhaps uh, scheduled the child's favorite activity on the weekend of access? And, and uh, so it, it requires some, some working out uh, in, in that respect. Or um, again, uh, I'm thinking about a situation where this child didn't want to go visit the parents because none, none of the kid's friends were there. Well, all it took was for the other parent to get a dog and then the child was happy to go visit the other parent. It seems terribly simplistic, but I'm talking about younger children who are easily influenced and, and swayed. In terms of, of, the, of the courts, I, I see the, the court's role as, as being um, a limited one because the options are so limited for a court. And, and the more you, you get into the court proceedings, of course, the more the party's positions are fixed and the less room you have to maneuver. And I guess about the only thing I would say was that in terms of the Court of Appeal, um, the court has a um, directive, uh, which is really not really well known, that says that if any person who has an appeal wishes to have a pre-hearing appellate conference, um, that you have only to call Mr. Gauntlet, who is the uh, registrar of the uh, court, to, to try and uh, uh, to make an appointment if, and the court would be pleased to uh, have someone uh, conduct a pre-hearing appellate conference. This initiative is trying to, we're trying to uh, put more impetus into that initiative in the new year and I want to assure people that this is not something the court would impose. This would be something that both parties would have to agree and obviously any, the judge conducting that, that conference would not uh, uh, be uh, on the panel hearing the appeal and, and, and there would be no communication with the panel hearing the appeal. Thank you, Karen. I think um, your comments on, um, if I'm correct, the title for this is, a, is it a 
pre-hearing pre appellate conference. Pre-hearing appellate conference really takes us into the last issue that I want to touch on, and I think it's really a way of, of finishing up this uh, day. Uh, Peter's comments suggested that um, we really need to think about uh, new ways of dealing with this um, group of divorcing families at the end of the spectrum, high conflict families. Uh, in the past, uh, our approach has been to think about reducing conflict, managing conflict, encouraging people to co-parent and cooperate. And for this group of families, those solutions we are increasingly recognizing are not appropriate. And I think an, um, an issue on the table right now for reform is what do we do with this group of families? The federal government has said that it wants to think about developing specialized services, specialized interventions for this group of families. And I think the question on which we're going to end is we're thinking about reform. We're thinking about making the system better. We know that uh, there's a wide range of families. There is this group of high conflict families. What would you do to make the system work better? And I think we've heard from Jeff already, and I'm not going to give him another chance to speak. But Wilson, yeah. as the representative of children's interests uh, in Ontario today, what would make the system work better? What can we well, do with let, this let me say high one conflict families? one thing carol and that's in this book by janet johnson people have been referring to this book it's called in the name of the child it's a very interesting read uh, janet johnson is the successor in notoriety and in in her uh, skills and ability to uh, wallerstein and she says at page 222 and just let me read one paragraph what is most troubling is that these families often that's the high conflict family often do not seem to resolve their conflicts despite the increased attention they receive and the unusual amount of private and public resources expended on their behalf. That's the court system. Instead, their children continue to be exposed to the constant stress and disruption of their parents' disputes, unremitting anger and distrust. It is time to use the public and private resources already being expended in cost-efficient and clinically effective dispute resolution forms that will be more responsive, more humane, and more suited to the needs of these families. And then she goes on to describe subsequent to that, that she sees, and I think this is the key for all of us, that the role of the new, quote, unified, end quotation marks, family court in Ontario, which within two to five years will be unified across the province in my view, uh, should be the leader in each and every community of Ontario in bringing a resolution to these disputes. And the way the leadership is shown is that the judges through case management and the court's administration through technology and record keeping are able to monitor and to bring people to be accountable for their decisions on behalf of their children. Now note what I said, their decisions. In other words, the leadership is, if these resources are mixed properly, that mom and dad will agree. My last point is, and I don't know the answer to this one, that in property rights matters, it's rather strange that no judgment of the court is enforceable against a child at all. Uh, I'm sorry, no agreement is enforceable against a child unless it is reduced to a judgment. That's even if there was not an action before the court. No one is suggesting so far that custody and access disputes, especially the high conflict ones, should be approved by a judge before they are enforceable or uh, bringing further public resources to bear upon the problem. Um, I think that should be looked at very carefully and that the Rules Committee or the legislation should be looked at as to uh, getting the courts to be, take a more active role in the result of these cases. I think we have to end. It's one minute after five and I was told to, oh, Peter? Yeah, I just want to uh, just make one brief point and that is uh, I agree with uh, 
my esteemed colleague's comments, having known him for many years, I guess I'd go further and I'd, I'd like to see one judge, one family. I guess I'm, I'm tired after 25 years in the system of seeing uh, people shop around, you know, back and forth between the criminal court and family court. It's almost like all the things that were ever invented to help families pre-trials um, are all being abused uh, in many jurisdictions. And I guess I'd like to see much better case information. I'd like to see judges as managers. I'd like to see one judge do all criminal, family, child protection. There's far too much uh, waste. And I'd, I'd like to have a screening procedure so the families that would benefit from Jeffrey's Hall approach could get screened out quickly and the ones that really need a thoughtful uh, judge manager will get one to stick with that family for a lifetime because that's what it, because it requires, it doesn't require brilliant legal decisions. I think they're, they're none for these families. What it requires is a good case manager who will ensure protection of the children and spouses in these circumstances. Thank you. And that brings us to the end. We're two minutes, three minutes after five, and I violated Harold's strict instructions, but I'm sure he'll forgive me. <laughs> That uh, concludes the program. Thank you to all the speakers and to all of you for having the patience to, uh, to sit through a very long day. Thank you all. And read all this stuff. It's terrific.